All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick us off then as maybe one or two other people are, uh, trickle in. But uh, welcome everyone to today's lecture of opportunity on African security issues in the Biden era featuring uh, our very own uh, Naval War College adjunct professor, Dr. Richard Loban. Richard is a professor emeritus of anthropology and African studies from Rhode Island College. We taught there for 35 years and his journey has also taken him to teach at the University of Khartoum, American University in Cairo, Tufts University, Carnegie Mellon, and Dartmouth. Uh, I'd like to sort of portray Richard as a Rhode Island's version of Indiana Jones, as an expert in archaeology and a field researcher. He spent a lot of time in Tunis and Egypt and Sudan. He was in Egypt during the uh, Arab Spring in 2011. He's done firsthand reporting of guerrilla conflicts in Eritrea and Southern Sudan and Guinea-Bissau. He is fluent in Arabic and French, and he also has uh, quite a bit of Spanish and Portuguese and Russian. And uh, by the way, he's just now at uh, Salva Regina teaching a course in uh, introductory hieroglyphics. So let's count that as another language as well, Richard. Uh, and you're, you're also teaching a course on how to run an archeological dig at Salve. Uh, Dr. Loban has authored many books, in, books and articles. Books include uh, Sudan Security, uh, a book uh, on Libya, uh, a book on African insurgencies. And those last two were co-written with a Naval War College uh, uh, graduate. He has two new books out, one on ancient Nubia and one on medieval Christianity in Nubia. He edited the U.S. Air Force's Expeditionary Manual on Sudan and South Sudan. He contributed to the Do Not Bomb list uh, in Sudan and in Libya. Um, and he admits that he has utterly and entirely failed at retiring. Uh, but I think, at, Richard, you actually, this is what right looks like in terms of retirement, because you, you're, you haven't really retired. Uh, you're, he's writing books, he's teaching courses, he's a court-appointed expert witness for political asylum cases for refugees from Africa and the Middle East. He is an active Naval War College adjunct professor, uh, has been with us for 15 years in that role, recently taught courses on ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and all of this expertise brings us to today's Lou on African security issues in the Biden era. Dr. Loban, sir, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And I sure do appreciate uh, Tim's support and, and Laurel's uh, critical backup. Uh, thank you for the uh, remarks and uh, that lets you uh, students know that I've been doing this for a long time, maybe about well, I think it's more than getting on to 60 years. I first went to Africa in 64, so it's been a while. And I haven't been there since last, uh, well, since last January when I was excavating. But anyway, uh, let's start to look at this uh, program. It's uh, African security issues. It's very comprehensive. Uh, usually I do deep, deep drilling into specific issues, particularly counterterrorism or climatology or something like that. But since we have a new administration, this will be things which, uh, issues which uh, President Biden uh, could put in his inbox. His inbox is already pretty filled up. But anyway, uh, we can go through these and then uh, when we get to the end, um, we should have uh, time. Uh, there's an error by the way, on that slide, because it should be 1315, not 1350. So we're not gonna be spending uh, almost two hours, just an hour and 15 minutes, and maybe just one, less than one hour. So there'll be time for you know, comments and questions. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, the bottom of that slide says, this is just my ideas. It's not US government or Biden's or anybody's ideas, just my ideas. So you can be as critical as you like. All right, Laurel, uh, maybe you can shift to the next slide. Now, because I'm an anthropologist, I think about security in a holistic and comprehensive and integrated way. Uh, all of them do relate, do interconnect one way or another. Uh, because of COVID these days and air pollution, I think about um, uh, health issues as probably pretty much uh, the, most, the most significant. Um, that would be uh, COVID and other um, water pollution and so forth. 
We do have uh, terrorism, of course, uh, widespread, particularly in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Uh, needless to say, also in Egypt, we have Ansar Beit al Magdis and, and even some cases in Eastern Congo. Uh, some of the lubrication for terrorism is from trafficking. Uh, trafficking feeds directly into criminal activities and into terrorist activities. Human trafficking across the Sahara and down the Nile uh, are really particularly evil, uh, with many thousands of casualties on the way and crossing the uh, Atlantic, crossing the Atlantic in the case of uh, Mor uh, Morocco, uh, and of course crossing the Sahara to Libya. Uh, drug and small arms and light weapons and pretty much almost anything can be trafficked to the animals and uh, the, the uh, bushmeat problem and so forth. Geopolitical uh, issues are certainly high on the security list. And uh, some of my students like Jason and uh, Julio uh, and some of the others who are with us today did take my course on Russia and China uh, in, uh, in Africa uh, just this last semester. There are many regional issues and I do think that uh, African security rests on a, st a strategic table of Egypt, Ethiopia, South Africa and Nigeria and how those countries go, uh, those regions which they dominate also will be um, influenced. Uh, and those four countries today are not doing that well to be frank about it. Uh, on a larger uh, level, we have many geostrategic uh, issues. Uh, papyracy, which has been pretty well tamed in the Indian Ocean, but still widespread in uh, the Gulf of Guinea off the coast of uh, Nigeria. Uh, geostrategic issues about oil, uh, oil bunkering, and of course, uh, strategic minerals, especially like coltan, are important. Uh, governance is uh, critical. Uh, right now, Africa is uh, on a kind of a seesaw between, uh, you know, abuse of power and, and dictatorships that are coming back and the struggle uh, on the grassroots level for human rights and democracy. Uh, certainly, cybersecurity is a, a major factor as well. Uh, and we uh, have somewhat neglected uh, the manipulation of information as well as criminal conspiracies uh, in particularly Nigeria and South Africa. Uh, military security, of course, both regime security as well as border stability and uh, external security. Frequently military security is focused on pr protecting the elites, particularly if they're military elites. And then economic security is of course critical uh, for preservation of markets and, and uh, meeting the uh, critical needs for employment for the huge youthful population. So there's a very comprehensive understanding that I have for, um, for security. Next one, please. Now in my classes on security, I am inspired by the so-called Maslow hierarchy of human needs. And you can see at the bottom, uh, physiological or health uh, needs, uh, these are frequently, uh, you know, not even resolved. Uh, so safety and security and so forth. And if we can't get above those levels in this hierarchy of human needs, there's no way we're going to get to the higher levels of writing constitutions and having uh, due process and, uh, you know, civil society or writing poetry. So uh, unfortunately, Africa is heavily locked in the bottom two layers of this Maslow hierarchy of, uh, or Maslow uh, human needs. And health security is really foundational. And there is a kind of dominance of health security in this particular PowerPoint. Okay, next one. So that's what I say, the biggest one for Africa and maybe for the world, particularly with COVID uh, is human health. And diseases kill far more people than the wars or terrorists. And uh, it's really critical for readiness, military readiness. So we can have, uh, I remember during the height of 
COVID in the Pacific, there was a whole aircraft carrier with nuclear weapons, but it couldn't leave port because there was a COVID epidemic on that ship. So uh, we have to be absolutely convinced of the uh, primacy of, uh, of health security. Next one. And just to put it into a military uh, context, um, to paraphrase Clausewitz, who that you've all been reading at some point, the battle against COVID is just a war by different, different means. And so if there's a health problem, there's a social problem and generates conflicts and thus a military problem. And if you think about the Thucydides trap, uh, we have the dominant USA uh, is not able to confront this extremely tiny enemy of COVID. Uh, nuclear bombs, Kalashnikovs aren't going to defeat COVID. So we have, uh, you know, this Thucydides trap, of course, has the dominant uh, power must be defensive and the insurgent power must be on the offensive. The insurgent power, of course, is COVID in this particular case. So it might be a way to uh, think about it. All right, next one. Now, none of these problems, the health problems, are anything new. Uh, COVID is just uh, especially problematic these days, but Africa is heavily uh, infested with parasitic diseases, uh, waterborne particularly through snails and so forth, uh, bacterial infections, uh, especially uh, cholera and, and these kinds, and then the viral diseases. Uh, that, of course, that's what we have uh, these days. And even Africa has already uh, sourced um, one of the new forms, the new variant forms of COVID-19 from South Africa. And it seems like it might be heading to the US uh, as well as the new English uh, variant. Okay, next one. So for the parasitic diseases, we got all these nasty things, uh, the skin diseases, ectoparasitic, that affect the skin, surface of the skin, then the waterborne ones, uh, that come out through your eyes and through blood vessels and uh, are transmitted through uh, like Ascarius uh, uh, worms through, uh, through the contaminated meat. Um, and then we have the protozoan uh, varieties. Uh, these are in almost entirely in, have a water vector. Malaria of course is uh, through the mosquitoes, but they have to have a water uh, waterborne uh, period, trypanosomiasis, sleeping sickness, leishmaniasis. There's a lot of nasty diseases. And anytime uh, militaries, either African militaries or American, uh, you know, AFRICOM visiting militaries, they have to be concerned about these because they will become problems. Next one. So African mortality, there are a lot of ways to be sick. Uh, you can see that some of the big ones are cholera, uh, and meningitis, uh, maybe next one measles. And so although this is uh, declining, uh, COVID was not known until 2019, of course, how it got its name. Uh, AIDS has also been a very big uh, problem uh, and still uh, can be managed, but it hasn't yet been uh, cured. So there are many ways to be sick and visiting soldiers and sailors uh, have to be alert to that. Otherwise they will diminish their security uh, readiness. Next one, please. So the bacterial, although this is not really a health course, uh, you can see the bacterial infections in unclean, dusty, uh, unsanitary uh, environments, um, STDs, for example, upper respiratory and, and gastro enteritis are extremely significant factors that can destroy armies, destroy populations, and cause a great deal of insecurity. So we won't dwell on all those, but plenty of things to think about in terms of health security. Next one. Uh, if you have some spare time, although I think the War College keeps everybody pretty busy, and if you're either French or English is okay, you can read Camus uh, novel about Algeria, the plague that they had in 1947, just after World War II. And there were many other cases of plagues uh, and so forth. Algeria has one of the most serious cases, one of the high incidents. Uh, Algeria, South Africa, um, and Egypt are 
some of the more seriously affected. So that's for your spare time uh, reading. Next one. Uh, the All these nasty diseases, remember how we heard about Ebola and Marburg? Well, it's not solved. Uh, there have been some recent outbreaks in Eastern Congo, maybe Western Uganda, even in the last few days. Uh, rabies is extremely, uh, it can be stopped, but it's extremely uh, deadly if it's not addressed rapidly uh, from either wild or dogs or other kinds of things. HIV AIDS, still a big problem in Africa, although it can be now managed. Polio and smallpox should be over, but there are places where uh, the public education, epidemiological education has not been adequate. Uh, for example, in um, Afghanistan and Nigeria. And then we have some of these other nasty things, Zika, we remember how we were all worried about Zika and Ebola uh, going to take over the world. Well, they have been uh, you know, managed and, and uh, limited, but take note of, of these diseases. Okay, next one. And so here's our favorite current disease, uh, remembering that it's novel because it wasn't seen before and we're already replacing it with other variants. It's co because it's corona shaped, like a sun sunshine. Uh, it's a V because virus, and it's D because it's a disease, and it's got 19 on the end of it from 2019. Uh, when it's out of control, when it's under control, tests are critical for tracking. When it's out of control, like it basically is uh, these days, uh, particularly in Brazil, in uh, some countries in Africa that I mentioned and in the US, then we just have to have the herd immunity by uh, widespread vaccination. So if you haven't had your first shot, go get it. If you need your second shot, go get it because it's in everybody's interest. Okay, next one. So um, many implications for COVID uh, because the infrastructure in Africa is weak, informational infrastructure, the practical infrastructure, ventilators, ICUs, all these things uh, which are uh, needed to, um, uh, to fight against COVID are in weak supply in, um, in Africa. Health, pre-existing health conditions, which you know are uh, co covariant with COVID are also widespread um, diabetes in particular and obesity, malnutrition, those are gonna make um, more serious uh, problems for the spread of COVID in Africa. Uh, one maybe slightly good news is that um, uh, th there's not a large senior population because short life expectancy. Uh, and so mortality in Africa is pretty high because of all the infrastructural weaknesses uh, but it's a, a very uh, serious problem. Next one. So because uh, of the health insecurity, political security has to be addressed. We found that COVID, uh, even in our own country in the US, became a political problem. And so effective political leadership and public education are critical uh, to have trust and and effective uh, delivery of vaccines. Otherwise, we get into political destabilization. I haven't seen any really good evidence yet uh, in the world of uh, counterterrorism, kinetic issues, but uh, you know, many of the terrorist insurgencies uh, in the Sahel, Horn of Africa, Shabab, Al Qaeda, and, and all these others um, probably have less infrastructure. And so maybe we'll see. Um, if they become even more desperate with more deaths just because they have even worse uh, infrastructure. So not to say I'm wishing you know, poor health to them, but that's a factor which might be um, worth, worth uh, looking at the effects of, uh, of COVID-19 on the terrorist groups. Okay, next one. So economic security, needless to say, with our own countries facing economic uh, problems because of COVID, unemployment has skyrocketed. 
ditto for Africa. Businesses will close in America and in Africa. Uh, manufacture has declined as companies can't uh, function. And the direct implication of that, taxes and tolls will be reduced because the economy is reduced. Sales uh, disrupted. And for Africa, all of these things are already under stress. And consequently, we can only imagine uh, that they will get uh, worse. If I didn't make it clear enough already, uh, COVID and all the other health security dimensions are global and we cannot deal with them uh, uh, regionally or just by country by country. We have to have a framework which is integrated, comprehensive and globalized. Okay, next one. Needless to say, uh, food security is gonna be disrupted. Populations are displaced. Populations cannot uh, meet, the, meet the markets. And since food is at the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy of human needs, we need to address this with uh, uh, effective logistics measures, uh, with uh, looking at the disease vectors in particular. All right, next one, thank you. Um, so needless to say, because of my view that this is holistic and integrated, uh, cultural security is going to be uh, required. Um, cultural security bringing, uh, you know, um, dominant groups have to be checked against the subordinate groups uh, who will be uh, more displaced in displacement from uh, cultural, from health, epidemiological, and particularly climatological displacement are very much um, a factor. As we know in poor populations, uh, domestic abuse, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, all these things will be increased uh, when there's social cultural stress. Uh, and of course, social distancing, which is required for addressing uh, some controls of COVID, it's very difficult in the increasingly urbanized countries where we have many mega cities, Cairo, uh, you know, uh, Lagos and, and, and so forth, mega cities, it's very difficult uh, to have the social distancing to control uh, disease. Okay, next one. So um, with poor governance, uh, we find poor control over air and water pollution. That's for sure. Uh, some of the roadways are poor. So we find one relatively high cause of death in Africa are uh, tra traffic accidents. Um, so all these things have to be uh, to, to be uh, addressed. Um, with poverty, we find poaching and trafficking, especially of bushmeat. Latest research in China uh, seems to indicate that one of the principal sources of uh, of COVID-19 was uh, e eating uh, bush meat, uh, wild meat, particularly uh, you know bats and other animals like that. Uh, that was how Ebola started by eating eating bats in uh, Liberia and Guinea Conakry. Okay, next one. Now, uh, having had malaria three times myself, I can say one time I just about didn't make it. Uh, but this is one of the waterborne diseases which are uh, epidemic in, uh, in Africa. Uh, it can be treated with uh, chloroquine, uh, by the way, not so good for COVID-19. Uh, and there are negative effects of any of the uh, chloroquine or quinine derivatives. But if you get deployed either on a partnership basis or whatever, make sure you do take your pills Although I must say I'm a bit cynical about that because I was taking my pills every time that I got malaria. Anyway, take note of that. Next one. And AIDS, we can see, uh, maybe it's not so well reported, uh, but we do know that Southern Africa is the worst case for, uh, for AIDS. It is managed with the uh, various cocktails but certainly in poverty conditions where we find uh, prostitution is required to sustain uh, the economy, uh, then we find uh, high incidence of, uh, of, uh, of AIDS, HIV AIDS. 
particularly in Central and Southern Africa. So mind your manners uh, if you happen to be deployed to those areas. Okay, next one. So urbanization um, and population security does connect, uh, I think every single solitary problem in the world and in Africa has a covariant with uh, population. Uh, increased populations uh, should not necessarily cause problems, but they often do because it means resources, housing resources, road resources, food resources, water resources, every kind of resource is gonna be stretched that much more by population insecurity. Needless to say, you've got cultural variables about fertility and mortality and birth control and family planning. And so those have to be uh, handled with uh, care and caution uh, relative to cultural sensitivity. Uh, but of course we do find that uh, large families were favored in the past, in the past decades, because there was such high mortality. So if we can reduce the high infant mortality in particular and replace it by family planning, then we can get some uh, handle on the issues of population, which do of course stress absolutely every single other factor. Okay, next one. So in the case of uh, uh, COVID, uh, this is from almost a uh, year ago, uh, and a few things have stayed the same, and a few things got worse. Uh, for the last data that I could see just before the class started, Algeria is actually much worse. South Africa is still really bad. Nigeria is probably getting worse and parts of East Africa, particularly in the Horn of Africa, getting worse because there has been so much uh, conflict now in Ethiopia against Oromo and against uh, Tigray uh, with populations drifting in, refugee populations into Sudan. And then we have the failed states, uh, for example, Somalia, Republic of South Sudan and uh, Libya, all failed states, or maybe Eastern Congo is pretty much almost a failed state with war also in Cameroon. These are gonna just make uh, the um, situation for COVID and all the other vectors of health much worse. Next one. So this was a year ago uh, and these uh, countries were with the exception of Sudan, which is, seems to be about stabilizing, it's not really good, but Nigeria, big population, coastal population of Algeria, the big, uh, those top three or the top four really stay very uh, high in terms of casualties and infection rates for, uh, for uh, COVID. Next one. Uh, by comparison, the 10 worst cases uh, were these on the, on the, on the left. Uh, and number four and five, U.S. and South Africa, are still extremely high. Israel is a small state, but it, it has cultural factors of some of the Orthodox who are very reluctant to, um, to get uh, vaccinations. That's a pretty high rate. Uh, and Brazil also very high and increasing. Um, Oman was terrible, but uh, at various points, we had a whole bunch of American uh, states, you know, uh, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and so forth, which had actually worse states, uh, worse rates of COVID, even than Oman, which a year ago was one of the worst per capita. Okay, next one. So I think uh, this is pretty much covered. Uh, and the only thing I want to uh, mention uh, in this is that last line that we, when we rely on World Health Organization data, we are hoping that the data are accurate, uh, but we actually know that that's not the case. Uh, poor data co connect, uh, collection and sometimes political repression from making high COVID rates uh, politically unacceptable. Uh, so we really don't know uh, with great precision. Uh, so we have the sort of the tip of the iceberg and Anytime you have over, let's even say 8% or 
or 10% infection rates, we got a serious problem. And those are some of the countries uh, where that's the, the case besides uh, North Africa, uh, Morocco, Algeria, uh, South Africa, Egypt. Okay, next one. Now, finally, I think we've covered the health adequately, but I just wanted to give it uh, a priority. And in this uh, chart, I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but you can see that the frequency of conflicts, especially across the Sahel, do correlate with desertification and climate change. Every one of these uh, across the Sahel is the conjuncture of, uh, of the desert, Sahara Desert or other deserts like in the Ogaden and the uh, rainforest. Uh, and it's no surprise, I'm not a climatological determinist, but you have to have your head buried in the Saharan sand to fail to see that, um, uh, that uh, there is a strong correlation between desertification, climate change, uh, and impactation of climate with conflict. Uh, so for example, in Nigeria, we've got Boko Haram in Mali, and Burkina Faso, we've got Ansaruddin and MLA, MNLA and Al Qaeda. Uh, and of course, in Ethiopia, we have uh, these new movements with uh, Oromo. North South Sudan is just never really settled. And uh, in Shabab, in the Horn of Africa, it's still destabilizing uh, the Somalia. So, uh, climate, climatology, uh, epidemiology, population pressure desertification all do triangulate. If you make like a Venn diagram, you can see that when all those things converge, we're almost guaranteed to have conflict. Okay, next one. So I think we've covered this in earlier slides, but I think it should be really clear that uh, when these factors are, are convergent, it's going to be a serious, of course, health problem but then we have to have both defensive and offensive tactics to deal with the uh, counterterrorism uh, that does emerge uh, to, to uh, confront in, in African insurgencies. All right, next one. And on this uh, topic, um, I do have uh, you know, a whole uh, book on African insurgency that was written by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Dalton, former War College student and myself. And this is an inventory uh, from the colonial to the uh, era to the present time. And we can talk a great deal about these. I usually have a whole course just on, on these groups, ISIS clones, Al-Qaeda in Maghreb, Ansar Sharia in Egypt, Paul Osario in Western Sahara, Boko Haram uh, in in Chad Basin, uh, Lake Chad Basin, Nigeria and Niger, and Bazonia, uh, insurgency amongst uh, Anglophone uh, against Francophone people in Cameroon. The ADF, it's an ISIS-based uh, group in the uh, Eastern Congo. The LRA seems to be a bit quiet, but anyway, uh, and Dominic Ungwen of the LRA just has been sentenced to life in The Hague. The NMLA, the National Liberation Movement for Azawad, the Berber group, they are still functioning. And we find even in Eastern Senegal, uh, some clones of those guys are around. Ansar Beit al uh in Egypt, in Sinai. Darfur insurgency is not completely solved. Shabab, of course, in, uh, uh, in Somalia. Uh, so these, uh, if you are interested, send me an email and, or, and uh, you can buy this book. It's a sort of encyclopedic on all these particular groups, but they do descend from the convergence of all the factors which we've done the deep drilling into in the first part of this uh, lecture of opportunity. Next one. Uh, now, as I mentioned, um, this is just on cocaine trafficking, but doesn't make any much difference. You can change it to marijuana, change it to cocaine, change it to heroin, particularly from South America, from Colombia, from Brazil, from so forth. Uh, and it goes up the Atlantic coast past Canaries, just destabilizing that area. 
uh, the Trans-Saharan routes. And then of course we have uh, East African uh, counterparts. Uh, so any of these trafficking mission, trafficking enterprises, whether it's drugs, uh, the southbound small arms and light weapons from the collapse of the Libyan state, and then human trafficking, uh, up especially these days through uh, Libya, uh, where thousands of pe oh, people have already died in the Mediterranean. And then they in turn destabilize Italy, France, and, and England. They become my clients frequently uh, for political asylum cases. So all of these things uh, feed uh, the degradation of human rights, uh, feed slavery, feed neo-slavery, feed uh, terrorism, because these are all criminal, you know, outright criminal operations or actually organized uh, uh, insurgent groups that I've just uh, mentioned. Okay, next one. So this is just a little bit more about the uh, trafficking statistics. And you can see that uh, uh, particularly for women, they're heavily involved in prostitution uh, because they have no uh, res resources to do anything else. Uh, and the, the, while well, the, the largest um, uh, number of uh, people are actually in Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, uh, certainly has its uh, sad share of uh, trafficking. And of course, mostly they're ref economic refugees, political refugees, climatological refugees, that causes the displacement and people willing to subject themselves to uh, abusive and repressive measures, sort of neo-slavery. Next one. <clears throat> so here's another example. You can see that the Western part is as a result of uh, Boko Haram and Amazonia. DRC in the middle has got people coming from Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and going back to Rwanda and Burundi. And that so-called darkest spot of Africa, uh, South Sudan bordering DRC, uh, Central African Republic and Ethiopia is highly destabilized. It's uh, truly a failed state. Um, I was recently in Ethiopia and Somaliland, uh, Eritrea as well, and it wasn't particularly stable then, uh, relatively repressive, struggling to be democratic, but not having a big success. And, uh, and this region of Africa is one of the most uh, neglected, the most difficult to uh, solve. <clears throat> we'll look a little bit more closely at the Central African Republic um, when we get to Russia and Africa. Next one. So here's a visual image uh, how uh, these overcrowded uh, vessels try to go from Libya uh, to Italy, to, uh, to Lampedusa and so forth, with of course thousands uh, dying and particularly abused on the, on the way, held in ransom and so forth. Uh, very, very tragic in the human terms. Next one. <coughs> so needless to say, in this fairly grim picture with so many convergent uh, negative things, uh, water security for drinking, for agriculture, and for good health is uh, highly vulnerable. Look at that uh, uh, diagram on the, on the upper left. Fresh water is just 2% of the world's water. So we hardly have any. And then where is most of that uh, fresh water? It's locked up in ice, maybe some melting these days. So we have just a very, very small fraction of available water for human needs, which is fundamental and critical back to the Maslow hierarchy of human needs. And you can see in this conflict uh, picture on the right-hand side that it correlates strongly with with the climatological variables uh, of desertification. If you don't have enough water, you don't have enough food. If you don't have enough food, you have famine. Famine gives rise to crisis and displacement. And then there we go back to trafficking. That circle is completed once again. Next one. Uh, since I love looking at climates, and this is after, after all an American Naval College, uh, in case you thought African climates weren't related, 
here's a history of hurricanes hitting the, in the North Atlantic only, all starting in Cape Verde Islands in West Africa, never going east, always going west because of the uh, Coriolis effect, which the globe is rotating eastward, so the hurricanes go westward, uh, and always having the uh, intertropical convergence zone, the ITCZ, always causing, uh, that's high pressure from the north and low pressure from the south, always causing counter cyclonic uh, rotation. And this, of course, also represents uh, movements of the North Atlantic gyre, which if we go back into history, uh, this was the Middle Passage and the Gulf Stream for the triangle trade of the slave trade. The slave trade, of course, was just uh, uh, trafficking, which made America rich. Okay, next one. Now I mentioned in the Central African Republic, we have some pretty alarming cases of the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group is directly uh, under control of Vladimir Putin. And Evgeny uh, Prigozhin, who's above, uh, above him, and then Dmitry Utkin on the top. Uh, these are the sort of private mercenary army. Uh, they were heavily involved, they still are heavily involved in Syria. But in the case of uh, Central African Republic, uh, Putin has invested his uh, elements, these mercenary groups, to look into the diamond and gold business. And when some reporters were sent there to investigate, uh, they were assassinated by uh, assassins from the Wagner Group. Uh, they are, their biggest involvement right now is in Libya, and they have been key in backing the government, well, the attempted government of Khalifa Heftar in eastern Libya, where most of the oil is. Uh, I have a great deal of anxiety about them. There's, there's no democratic control. Uh, they usually go with no uh, insignia on their uniforms, and they are directly uh, responsive to, um, to the FSB, which you can see the Russian version, and the GRU, basically CIA, and and in the military intelligence of Russia. Uh, so this is uh, something uh, that has to be uh, put into the equation. Next one. So this is, you know, there's uh, uh, on the top picture, there's one of the uh, generals of Putin meeting Khalifa Heftar. Uh, Libya is a big prize, small population, massive amounts of uh, of oil, uh, strategic position in the Mediterranean. And of course, uh, Putin is a big supporter of Egypt um, and Heftar, uh, partly because they are major rivals to Turkey. And so on the geostrategic level, NATO, Turkey is still in our NATO alliance, although maybe sometimes not so helpful. Uh, and they have their own rivalry to uh, to um, to Russia for their own geostrategic uh, uh, reasons. So at the macro level in Africa, we have some very important things to keep into the equation. Okay, next one. Uh, in case you didn't know, um, probably every one of you has a cell phone. And uh, within the cell phone, besides the gold and copper, is coltan. Uh, and coltan is heavily from Africa. Uh, it's mined under terrible conditions. Uh, it's trafficked. It's one of the valuably uh, trafficked minerals. And, um, and of course, coltan and, of course, blood diamonds are also heavily trafficked um, and not well maintained, easily transportable in small scales, high value. So take note about that. I'm not sure how we can fully address coltan. Coltan is Columbium tanzanite, if you'd like to know the full uh, mineral name of it. Next one. Uh, now, of course, we have had so much discussion about fake news and hoaxes and all this. Big problem in Africa, too. We have 
uh, the, the normal criminals like the 519 schemes in Nigeria and South Africa, where they're just a bunch of self-serving crooks, uh, you know, with different fraudulent schemes. But then when we get to the informational security and control of information, I think we're familiar with that as a domestic issue or European issue or Asian issue. Uh, it's also an issue in the less uh, democratic regimes in Africa where there's not freedom of press and so forth. So uh, this is at the, uh, at the 10,000 foot level of major issues that have to be addressed. And we do now have within our DOD, we do have a cybersecurity branch and uh, maybe AFRICOM will have to upgrade uh, its role uh, relative to Africa. Next one. So these are some of the, uh, you know, uh, this is from South Africa, but this is uh, some of the um, uh, issues that have to be addressed. Uh, and, and if they're neglected, then of course we have uh, serious problems, both in, uh, in information control and of course in criminal uh, conspiracies and, uh, and such. Next one. Now it may be forgotten but on that lower left, you can see that there are many undersea cables around Africa and they have to be monitored, particularly in the places uh, that are very deep. And we have Russian and Chinese, probably submarines looking into that. Um, and of course, where they come out of the, uh, of the undersea you know, landings, uh, these are highly vulnerable and they can, can completely shut down uh, cyber networks. I remember when I was living in Egypt, well, during the Arab Spring, uh, there was a ship that had accidentally just dragged across one of these cables, dragged its anchor, and all of Egypt uh, internet was shut down until they could identify the problem. So clearly this is a, for the Naval War College is something that has to be uh, addressed and understood as a serious vulnerability. Next one. Um, I, I think that uh, we, we need with uh, maybe re strengthen the Department of State and the whole of government and with um, AFRICOM having the whole of government, uh, all of the various uh, uh, ministries, health, education, uh, so forth, needs to be re redoubled. Um, there were some unfortunate remarks made about Africa by the past administration. And if we hope to get uh, those four strategic countries, Egypt, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and South Africa back on a reasonable uh, path towards democracy and human rights so that we can fight terrorism and fight trafficking, then um, we need to have a strong leadership in, in the United States government uh, in these uh, soft power dimensions. Uh, Russia needs great caution in my opinion. China needs serious competition. Uh, we're more or less 20 years behind China if we can get going again. The failed states and troubled uh, regions need much more st stability. Uh, dictatorships need to be isolated and sanctions. Uh, it's a, a gigantic uh, menu for the Biden administration. Next one. Next, here we are. So bottom line, we're getting to the, uh, towards the end, so we'll have enough time for uh, some questions and comments. Sure, Biden's got so many things on the inbox, but Africa cannot be neglected by US uh, government, by Department of State, by DOD, DOE, all of the uh, branches of our government. Some security problems in Africa are global and need global attention, climate and health that we've have been emphasizing uh, today. Other securities are regional and they can also be addressed by, by AFRICOM, which does in principle have a whole of US government. And then by the partnerships, for example, the state uh, air national guards and so forth that partner with African countries. And some of course are just national and the U.S. needs to lead on these uh, renewed and, 
and credible supports for the national prop, uh, problems. So the first step for the Biden administration is what are, what are the problems? I've given a big inventory of those. What are the global ones? And for that taxonomy, what are the regional ones and what are the national ones? And if you begin to uh, differentiate uh, the security issues on those three levels, global, regional, and national, then at least you can prioritize and figure out the right tools which could be applied to addressing these security issues. Uh, next one. So a uh, little bit cynical conclusion. People are asking these days, who's still doing uh, nails and hair? Uh, your local mortician is doing them. So stay home, keep your masks on. I have kind of taken mine off a little bit. Uh, keep social distance, wash your hands and get your vaccine. I think that might be the last slide. Let me see, go ahead. If it's the last one, then it's time for your comments.